You're listening to Innovators, the podcast from Harris Search Associates, where we speak with global leaders in education, research, engineering, and the health sciences, and ask them to share lessons learned as they continue to advance the frontiers of innovation and discovery. Today's podcast will be led by Rick Skinner, Senior Consultant. This is the third in a series of Innovators podcasts devoted to the state of pediatric research, its relationship with children's hospitals, and the type of leadership called for by both the research and hospital organizations. In the May 2017 issue of the journal Pediatrics, three researchers, Tina Ching, Clifford Bogue, and George Dover, forecast seven great pediatric research achievements to come about in a not too distant future. The forecast was based on responses to an open-ended survey from pediatricians who are also professional board members. The authors of the article acknowledged the intellectual risk of such an undertaking, even if drawing on the view of experts in the field of pediatric research. There are far more good historians than there are prophets, they noted, if only because most people tend to predict the future as an extension of the recent past and immediate present. Nevertheless, Ching, Bogue, and Dover hazarded the following seven promising areas of research on the verge of breakthroughs that will impact the health of children, adolescents, adults, and communities. Number one, more pediatric immunizations prevent emerging and persistent diseases. Number two, cancer immunotherapy in pediatrics shows great promise. Number three, Genomic discoveries predict, prevent, and more effectively treat diseases. Number four, big life course data recognize fetal and childhood origins of adult health and disease, resulting in effective early intervention. Number five, knowledge of the interaction of biology and the physical and social environment leads to effective prevention for individual and population health. And number six, Quality improvement science creates safe, efficient systems of care. And seven and final, implementation and dissemination research reduces global poverty. In this series of innovators interviews, we ask persons steeped in the worlds of pediatric research and children's hospitals to provide their respective assessments of the progress made or delayed in the seven achievements. And in the process, we sought to understand the role leadership plays in administering their organizations that are the home to children's research and care. We began our series with Dr. Mark Batshaw, Executive Vice President, Physician in Chief and Chief Academic Officer at Children's National Hospital, and followed that with an interview with Mark Witeka, CEO of the Children's Hospital Association. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with one of the authors of the 2017 Pediatrics article, article, Dr. Tina Ching. She is the Rackford Professor and Chief of Pediatrics at the University of Cincinnati and is Director of Cincinnati Children's Research Foundation and Chief Medical Officer of Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Dr. Ching is a graduate of Brown University where she also earned her medical degree In addition, she earned a Master of Public Health from the University of California at Berkeley. Her residency was completed at the University of California at San Francisco, and she did the same in her pediatrics fellowship at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. Dr. Chin came to Cincinnati only very recently after a stellar career at Johns Hopkins, where she directed the Department of Pediatrics and was pediatrician in chief of Johns Hopkins Hospital and the Charlotte Bloomberg Children's Center. Her recent research and publications reflect very much a perspective in which children's health is affected by disease, but also by social determinants affecting problems such as youth violence. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and past president of the American Pediatrics Association. A sense of the scope of what the University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's Medical Center seek to accomplish is evident in a monthly series of virtual seminars they are offering on envisioning our future for children. And two recent seminars 
respective titles include The Moral Determinants of Health and Bending the Arc, Arc of History for Children. And let me begin by saying to you, first of all, Dr. Ching, thank you to taking time out to be with us on Innovators. As you reflect back over the four years since you and your colleagues wrote the article in pediatrics, which of the ones of the seven achievements that you cited is most encouraging and most promising? Which of those moved forward as hoped and which of those have sort of lagged behind? And let's start with the ones who've made progress. So yeah, I'm looking back at the uh, the seven that we listed out, and we were just um, you know thinking about where are we going in the field of science and in pediatric research in particular. Um, this was a project that really started with a campaign first on what were the past seven great achievements in pediatric research in the past 40 years, um, and it was a campaign to really remind everyone, um, researchers as well as the public, that we have made tremendous uh, progress in the last. 40 years, last century um, in public health and in medicine. Um, and those seven, I don't know if you talk about those seven, but those seven um, included things like immunizations, like back to sleep with uh, for sudden infant death. Um, it included increasing life expectancy for chronic illnesses like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease. Um, you know, uh, 40 years ago, life expectancy was about 12 to 14 years. and uh, later became uh, is over 40 years now. It included things like surfactant to save premature babies, um, also included uh, the uh, decreased transmission of HIV from mother to baby with uh, the introduction of antiretrovirals, um, as well as uh, decreasing, uh, decreasing car injuries uh, from, from seat belts and, uh, and child car seats. Um, and so really uh, wanted to highlight those achievements that have been made. And um, it's pretty incredible how life expectancy has increased dramatically because of some basic achievements. And so this article was really a follow on to talk about where are we going now? And uh, are we gonna see a similar level of, uh, of achievements and accomplishments in the next you know, 40 years or the next century? Um, so you know, in looking at that article, which is you know, four years old now, um, I was excited that we put immunizations as number one. Um, and I think in this pandemic, we're seeing the fact that immunizations um, are, uh, have incredibly saved lives for many of the diseases that are old diseases now that we don't even see anymore. Um, and now of course with COVID-19, it's been an incredible um, discovery uh, and an incredible public health um, effort to really help us get out of this pandemic. So. We had written about how there will be uh, immunizations for old diseases, um, and I think there's still a lot of work going on for you know diseases that we've known about for a long time, like um, like malaria, um, but also for for emerging um, diseases. And we didn't really expect to see something like um, like COVID, but um, obviously the foundation of science for immunizations and the the new discoveries have really made a huge difference. Um, some of the areas that I think we need to continue to work on that we listed. Um, the last one, the seventh one, was really uh, dissemination and implementation research for global health equity. And again, I think that this global pan pandemic has really demonstrated again the problem we have with um, inequity in health, um, inequity in access to, uh, to medical discoveries. Um, and I think we're struggling, we've seen in the COVID pandemic how um, even in this country, the number of cases, hospitalizations and deaths are unequally distributed, distributed racially um, with many more American Indians and African Americans um, affected um, with increased cases, hospitalizations and deaths. But then we also know globally um, it's also a problem and um, we're trying to get the, the, the immunization out there to everyone, um, but the uptake has not always been even. And um, you know, this is a global pandemic. We need to really address um, this pandemic uh, across the world because uh, infections travel. Um, so, uh, so I think that that area of implementation and dissemination research um, is, globally is uh, a continuing issue that we really need to focus on. As you think about immunizations and their 
progress. And by contrast, the, the lack of say as much progress as was hoped for in the area of inequities. What are the factors that caused one to accelerate and the other perhaps not to? Is it lack of investment? Is it lack of, of interest? Is it in the sense that uh, uh, it doesn't have. It doesn't affect my country or my society right now, so I'm not going to pay attention. What are the things that slow things down for some, but what are the ones that speed it up some things? I mean, I think we were faced with this incredible pandemic. Um, actually, we knew an infectious disease pandemic. We were kind of due for one, um, but uh, it came, and I think we realized we were probably not as ready as we should have been. Um, I think it brought together, you know, obviously there was urgency um, to addressing this and it brought together researchers of all types. Um, and actually, I think one of the success stories is the fact that uh, we were able to mobilize, um, you know, research across the translational spectrum from basic science research to clinical science um, to population health research. Um, you know, I think that, you um, that uh, the collaboration across those areas of, and those levels of research, some people call them T0, T1, T2, T3, T4 research, um, uh, to lead to, uh, to uh, a, a vaccine that worked um, was an incredible um, feat. And you know, it started with epidemiology, um, really understanding the distribution of disease. We didn't know, um, you know what kind of infectious disease this was at first, identifying it as a virus, identifying how the virus actually causes disease, um, and, uh, and then identifying you know, vaccines and other medications to address the illness. So it went from you know, epidemiology of just describing the disease to um, understanding the basic science to, uh, to testing different method mechanisms to, uh, to intervene and then developing a vaccine. And now we're in the phase of getting that vaccine out in the dissemination and implementation research to um, go from, from bench to bedside to community. And in some ways, your, your comments answered the other part of the question about why some have not moved forward. They may have just been supplanted by the importance of a global pandemic that may have frozen much of the other activity out. Yeah, I mean, I think we've learned some lessons from COVID. Um, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons from COVID. Um, I think that we've learned that um, that science matters, but you also need um, strong leadership um, to really move from the wisdom. I often talk about the wisdom, the will, and the wallet. Um, you need the wisdom and the science um, to uh, to address this public health threat. You need the will and the leadership. Um, to actually uh, to to accept this this um, this vaccine and this intervention, and then you know the wallet to um, to make it happen. Um, so, in, in the case of of let's talk a little bit about the the equity issue. You may know the work of Hans Rosling. He, he just passed away just a few years ago. He was a physician at Karolinska in Sweden, and he did work for the longest time, uh, primarily at looking at basic things we now know about how wealth is related to things like the family size and so forth. And, and what he did was to actually be able to collect long-term time series data and do analyses of that looked at what happened to that relationship between wealth and, and uh, childbearing and family size. And of course he could show it over about a 200 year period, rough data admittedly, and, and that, for many people, I can remember talking to people who had seen Rosalind, they said that was the one that clicked on to them, that sort of made the light go on and say, we understand something finally, that it really does. Now, we may not understand all of it, but we understand enough of it now to begin exploration. So it strikes me that in some ways, we've, we've come up against this whole inequities problem, probably at the right time in the sense that we know that it's possible to feed the world, for example, we know that, save for politics, perhaps. We may know how to immunize the world, save for politics and that. So mm -hmm. some things never change, I suspect. Yep, yep. Yeah, no, I feel like uh, we do know what works. Um, and I think we even said in the um, Seven Great Achievements paper, in a lot of instances, we know 
what works. We just need to disseminate it and implement it and have the will and the leadership to do that. And I'm reminded that the uh, same problem that uh, we saw here with uh, the lack of perhaps leadership, we saw the same thing happen in 1918 with the misnamed Spanish flu. Public officials denying what scientists and public health officials were telling them. So again, some things don't seem to change a whole lot. Let me turn to a, a slightly different question. I don't think there's any way that I could exaggerate the importance of children's hospitals to pediatric research. It would be hard to do that. But in some of my conversations with both researchers and people who operate in, in uh, children's hospitals, they point out that two things seem to be very important. One is the way in which the two organizations come together. That is, what is the structure and, and how does that work? And and in other cases, they talk about the culture that's bred across the two organizations. You've been at two really great universities, uh, both, of, both of which have done extraordinary things in, in the last 50, 60 years. Just how important is that legal structure and the relationship of the organization? And how, do, and how important is it about the culture that develops? So I think that uh, academic medical centers and children's hospitals have, you know, clearly played a huge role in the research um, that in the research mission, as well as in the clinical care and the educational missions that are so important. Um, and having uh, that support for continued research and continued progress um, and translating that from, again, basic science, clinical science to the bedside. Um, is, uh, is a, an important role that academic medical centers have played. Um, I also feel that uh, investment early in the life course is incredibly important in science and in research. I think there is growing evidence, there is growing evidence that shows that um, a lot of adult chronic illnesses have their antecedents early in life, whether that be prenatally, maybe even preconceptionally sometimes, um, and during childhood. And that focusing on you know, what makes a child uh, healthy or have an illness, um, obviously research there you know, influences what happens later in their childhood, but also in their adulthood. And some ev evidence that even genetics and epigenetics and gene environment interaction may actually shape um, inter the next generation as well. Um, so some of my work has you know, been on you know, children, but also, uh, also preconception um, and maternal health, um, and how does that influence adult health and intergenerational health? So really taking a life course and intergenerational perspective um, and focusing, you know, again, early, uh, what after somebody has an illness, um, you know, you need to can't man manage that illness, of course, but is there a way that we could have prevented that illness or, you know, forestalled that illness from, from happening um, and I think that the advent of, uh, of genomics um, is adding to that, uh, as well as growing knowledge about the social influences and the, the, the physical, environmental, and psychosocial influences on health combined with the genetics, um, which we're gonna know early in the life course, um, I think is our opportunity to improve health um, overall. Um, I think it's not going to be that long before we're going to be doing the fetal ultrasound on that penis and have their whole genome sequencing and mm -hmm. know a little bit more about that child and their family um, and potentially be able to predict preempt um, in more participatory um, and uh, precision medicine. Um, Elias Serhoni talked about the four P's of preemptive, predict, uh, predictive, participatory um, uh, medicine of the future. And I must I, I'd be remiss if I didn't also note the, the discussion now about in vivo techniques of, of dealing with, with genetic challenges once they've been identified. That, that to me is one of the more fascinating things about this, that the, the, while the fetus is still in the formation phase. So it's, yeah. Yeah. I want to follow up on something. You, you may not be the only person who has exactly the same relationship between the medical school, the university, and the hospital itself. But it's rare to find that. It is, 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 do you, is it your experience that the position you hold there at Cincinnati is unusual or is it 
fairly typical. I thought of Baylor and a few other places, but it's okay. a little unusual. And so children's, um, there are several freestanding children's hospitals in the, in the country. Um, there are many freestanding children's hospitals in the country, and it's been, um, in a, it's a growing number. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, where we have an academic affiliation with the University of Cincinnati, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, but we function as a freestanding children's hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and really to focus on, to, to focus on children, um, and again, to focus early in the life course. Um, I feel that uh, that's an area that we need to focus on for research, but also, you know, children overall, uh, they're about 9% of healthcare spending in the United States, but they're 100% of our future. Um, and so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, always, I always give that quote, but, um, but you know, point. when you think about um, health care overall, most of the cost is really in adult systems. So when, uh, so when uh, we are talking about um, saving money in the healthcare field, which you know, we actually are spending a large percentage of our GDP on health and, and many people say it's not sustainable, the rate of uh, increased healthcare costs. Um, but when you try to save money, a lot of times that's, um, that's focused on the, uh, the adult side. Um, and end of the life course. And so um, children's hospitals, I think, really are trying to, uh, to focus on children, invest in children, um, and, uh, and prevent some of the, the illness, illnesses that we see. Reminds of me somewhat of the dilemma of public health people. Public health people always say, if they do their job perfectly well, nobody yeah. ever knows about them. Yeah. And if pediatric researchers do really great jobs of taking care and doing exploration, then nobody yeah. remembers it later yeah. on. So right. you're, you're almost doomed by your success. And, and the, the more remarkable thing in the article you wrote back in 2017 was just how much had mm -hmm. been done to make it possible to, in effect, save vast sums of, of resources early on, as opposed, as opposed to simply dealing with chronic disease in life. Right. Uh, let, me, let me turn to one other one. And I, 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 this is a question that's been plaguing us for some time. Uh, no one would discount the importance of leadership in any organization. I, I don't think anybody would. But one of the things that happens when you begin talking about leadership, uh, it, it sort of starts losing its precision, it starts losing its focus, and, and it's very hard to understand what leadership, how act, leadership actually contributes to the progress made in research. Uh, I had occasion not long ago to, to talk to one of the, uh, one of the large uh, research centers that are related to the Department of Defense. And I asked them, you know, how do you, how do you sense that uh, leadership contributes? And they say, we know it's everything. But the more I pressed them to say, tell me exactly what happened. It was very difficult. So I'm, I'm going to put you on the hot seat this time. In the case of pediatric research and its relationship with children's hospitals. We know leadership contributes. How does it contribute? Is it in the willingness to invest when prospects are perhaps not so clear? What is the, how does leadership make the success of pediatric research in children's hospitals come about? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, leadership, leadership matters um, in really, uh, Helping gather the wisdom, develop the will, and and the, and allocate the wallet um, to the right areas. Um, obviously, you, it requires teamwork. Um, it's not one leader, but it's really moving a team and a group of people. Um, I uh, I feel like in children's hospitals, uh, we very much are servant leaders. Our main goal is making sure that children and families um, are receiving the best um, and have the opportunity to thrive. Uh, and so I think that we have a singular goal uh, towards that. Um, and that often helps in our leadership um, teams because we're all, we have that shared goal and, uh, and it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, effort. Um, you know, I also, when I think about what's worked in leadership and what were kind of the key drivers, um, there's an article by Steve Schroeder and um, Isaacs um, that looked at the past successes in public health uh, history, like seat belts, like um, lead poisoning, like smoking, 
Um, mm-hmm. And they, they looked at those and really studied them and found that there are four factors um, in leadership that made a difference. Um, one was, uh, was really, uh, again, wisdom and the research that really drove, um, drove, it drove the, uh, the advocacy that occurred. Mm-hmm. Um, second was really strong advocates, um, individual leaders uh, and advocates that were out there really um, uh, making the case. Third was partnership with media and working with the public um, and making the public aware of what the issue was. For instance, smoking um, was uh, strong advocates and then really uh, using the media and educating people about the dangers Mm -hmm. after research. And then fourth was law and regulation um, was also an effective mechanism to make change. Um, What wasn't in their list was the leadership of the medical community sometimes. Um, Sometimes the medical community was not necessarily uh, pushing some of these, weren't necessarily at the front of some of these public health battles, um, but came around um, again after there was highly credible scientific evidence um, that was found. Um, So I often think about that in our leadership as well. Um, You know, how do we really move on some of these big health issues? Um, And I think some of that uh, history um, of what worked in the past is, is instructive. Very instructive. I think the point you made there is a critical one. I think one of the difficulties that we find in many instances in talking about leadership of organizations uh, is this inability to communicate with a broader public. Uh Uh, That that is a a, a real challenge because after all, the the work you're doing is extraordinarily complex and, and not something that's readily understood on its own merits. So the person who has to make the case for why this is important really has to be someone who has an extraordinary breadth of intellect to begin with and also has to have the ability to focus on what people need to know. So you've done well. You've got the clearest one we've had so far after about three years. So it's helpful. Well, you know, I mean, in medical training, we don't always get taught how to, you know, communicate broadly, uh, effectively. Um, Uh, You know, it's it's interesting that so many... uh, physicians about 10 or 20 years ago began getting degrees in public health. Yeah. Now I'm convinced, well, you did that, I believe. I'm convinced that was a major help because if, if you do anything in public health, you realize that much of your time is going to be engaged in trying to persuade people uh-huh. to do something uh-huh. that they really don't often want to do. So yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. one last question then today, although I've got a list of about 40 more. There's a statement that came from uh, the February issue of of JAMA, and it goes something like this. The great scientific scientific achievement of 2020 was the development, testing, and approval of numerous vaccines in less than one year. COVID, exactly what you said. 65 years earlier, the SALT vaccine was heralded as one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. And as a child at the time who stood in line to get the shot and and the sugar. I remember it very vividly. What are the lessons of those two things? I, I, they're very different in some ways, but they're very similar in other ways. But if you're thinking of great achievements, those two clearly rate up there. But in, from the point of view of a pedi- pediatric researcher, what lessons do you draw from those two? So, you know, those are both vaccines, the COVID vaccine, the soft vaccine. Actually here at Cincinnati Children's, we talk about the Sabin vaccine, which was the oral polio virus and SOC was the, uh, the, the injected polio virus and um, at Cincinnati Children's, Albert Sabin was here. Um, but you know, vaccines um, have been a real success story for the world. Um, and it started much earlier than the polio vaccines. It probably started um, you know, even with smallpox and cowpox and, um, and Edward Jenner, but even prior to that in, in China and Turkey, they already had started um, inoculating people against smallpox. So I think that uh, through trial and error and experimentation um, and research, um, we discovered that, you know, that uh, vaccines actually work. And now we are discovering newer types of vaccines, um, newer methods for um, getting an immune response, uh, like the COVID vaccine um, is a newer vaccine, um, but uh, in our, able to do it in a quicker way 
um, mm -hmm. as well. So that's really um, a beautiful uh, scientific story um, for vaccines. Um, and I think what we've learned is that, you know, it requires years of years and years of, of work um, to make progress. Um, but uh, clearly vaccines have been an incredible success story um, preventing disease. Is it a sense that the old iceberg, the now a metaphor may be correct here, by the time you get to the vaccine, it's one sixth or one eighth or whatever the tip of the iceberg that sits out. But underneath all of that, there are decades and decades and decades of research, some of which may not have actually been directed at the question of vaccine. Uh -huh. uh, strikes me that your point is, is dead on, that, that it, if you do not invest in people doing the spade work, you're much less likely to see the kinds of success we've seen. Yeah. And, you know, that's the success story. That success was also accompanied by a lot of attempts that didn't work. Um, and, um, you know, every research study does not become a success. Um, and um, so that also requires investment, knowing that some of the experiments are not going to are not going to pan out. I'm reminded um, of, of baseball, the old thing about baseball, if you if you had 20 seasons in the major leagues and Cincinnati in particular, and you went up to bat and out of every 10 at bat, seven times you struck out. Mm -hmm. If you've hit three times, you'd go to the hall of fame. Yeah. Same is probably true of medicine and, and pediatric research and the like. Scientific research is a lot of misses. And if you get a few, that's progress. Yep. Dr. Jean, thank you very, very much today for taking time today to be with us. I wish you the very best there in the University of Cincinnati, and I look forward to having a chance to talk to you later on. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for listening to Innovators, a production of Harris Search Associates. We'll have more insightful conversations with global thought leaders to follow.